This video provides an overview of the major concepts included in Chapter 21, Thrift Operations. The term thrift institution or savings institution refers to a depository institution that specializes in mortgage lending. These institutions were created to accept deposits and then use much of those funds for mortgage loans, home equity loans, and mortgage-backed securities. Thrift operations include independent financial institutions, subsidiaries of financial conglomerates, and credit unions. Chapter 1 includes seven learning objectives. First, to describe the ownership and regulation of savings institutions. Second, to identify the key sources and uses of funds for savings institutions. Third, to explain the valuations of a savings institution. Fourth, to describe the exposure of savings institutions to various types of risk. Fifth, to explain how savings institutions manage interest rate risk. Sixth, to describe how savings institutions have been exposed to recent crises. And seventh, to provide a background on credit unions, including their main sources and uses of funds. Let's begin with the background on savings institutions or SIs. Savings institutions include savings banks and savings and loan associations, SNLs, with SNLs being the dominant type. Savings institutions are classified as either stock-owned or mutual, which are owned by depositors. Although most SIs are mutual, many SIs have shifted their ownership structure from depositors to shareholders through what's known as a mutual-to-stock conversion, which allows SIs to obtain additional capital by issuing stock. The regulatory structure for savings institutions, which was established by the Federal Reform or Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, involves some overlap among the regulators. The Financial Reform Act removed some of the previous advantages of SIs, and as a result, some SIs have attempted to become commercial banks or credit unions. Deposit insurance for SIs is provided by the Deposit Insurance Fund, or DIF, which is administered by the FDIC, which charges the SIs annual insurance premiums that are placed in the DIF. If an SI fails, the FDIC uses the funds from the DIF to reimburse depositors. Regulators conduct periodic on-site examinations of SIs using the CAMELS rating in a manner similar to commercial banks. In recent years, SIs have been granted more flexibility to diversify the products and services they provide. Many have expanded the scope of their businesses by merging with other businesses specializing in real estate, insurance, and brokerage services. Now let's look at the sources and uses of funds for thrift operations. Like commercial banks, SIs serve as financial intermediaries, but their sources and uses of funds differ from those of commercial banks. SIs have three main sources of funds, deposits, board funds, and capital. Savings institutions obtain most of their funds from a variety of savings and time deposits, including passbook savings, retail certificates of deposits, or CDs, and money market deposit accounts, or MMDAs. When SIs are unable to attract sufficient deposits, they can borrow on a short-term basis from three sources. Other depository institutions that have excess funds in the federal funds market, through purchase agreements or repos, or from the Federal Reserve. The capital or net worth of an SI is commonly used to support ongoing or expanding operations and is primarily composed of retained earnings and funds obtained from issuing stock. SIs typically use their funds for a number of purposes including maintaining cash, primarily to accommodate withdrawal requests of depositors. They also provide mortgages for residential and commercial properties, purchase mortgage-backed securities, they invest in other securities such as treasury bonds and corporate bonds. SIs offer consumer and commercial loans and provide temporary financing to other institutions through the use of repurchase agreements. The sources of funds represent liabilities or equity of an SI, whereas the uses of funds represent assets. This exhibit summarizes the main sources and uses of funds of SIs by showing the balance sheet of Ashland Savings, a fictitious SI that reflects the average allocation of assets for all SIs. We can observe that Ashland's main asset is mortgage loans, representing 50% of total assets, with the rest sprinkled among the remaining assets. This exhibit shows how SIs use the key balance sheet items to finance economic growth. They channel funds from their depositors with surplus funds to other households that purchase homes. They also channel funds to support investments in commercial property, thereby serving a major role in the development of the housing and commercial property markets. They also use some deposits to purchase treasury and municipal securities, thereby financing spending by the U.S. Treasury and municipalities. When SIs obtain and use funds, they commonly interact with other financial institutions, as summarized in this exhibit. They compete with commercial banks and money market mutual funds to obtain funds. 
and they compete with commercial banks and finance companies in lending funds. After originating mortgages, they sometimes sell them to insurance companies or other financial institutions in the secondary market. Many SIs have other financial institutions as subsidiaries that provide a variety of services, including customer finance, trust companies, mortgage banking, discount brokerage, and insurance. To perform their various functions, SIs participate in various financial markets as summarized in this exhibit. They rely on mortgage markets when issuing mortgage-backed securities or selling their mortgages in the secondary market. They engage with bond markets when issuing new bonds in the primary market or when buying or selling bonds issued by corporations or government agencies in the secondary market. Let's now move on to the next learning objective relating to the valuation of a savings institution. Savings institutions are commonly valued by their managers to monitor the SI's progress over time or by other financial institutions that are considering an acquisition of an SI. The value of an SI can be modeled as the present value of its future cash flows, just like a commercial bank. And in the same way, the value of an SI should change in response to changes in its expected future cash flows and to changes in the rate of return required by investors summarized by this model. The change in an SI's expected cash flows is a function of changes in economic growth, the risk-free interest rate, industry conditions to which SI's are exposed, such as regulations, and the abilities of the SI's management. The change in the rate of return required by investors who invest in an SI is a function of changes in the risk-free rate and the risk premium. An increase in the risk-free rate results in a higher return required by investors. High inflation, economic growth, and a high budget deficit place upward pressure on interest rates, whereas the Fed's expansionary monetary policies places downward pressure on interest rates. If the risk premium on an SI rises, so will the rate of return required by investors who invest in the SI. High economic growth results in less risk for an SI because its consumer loans, mortgage loans, and investments in debt securities are less likely to default. This exhibit provides a framework for valuing an SI. In general, the value of an SI is favorably affected by strong economic growth, a reduction in interest rates, and high quality management. The sensitivity of an SI's value to these conditions depend on its own characteristics. For example, the value of an SI that emphasizes real estate and insurance services will be more sensitive to regulations that restrict or limit the offering of those services than will the value of an SI that focuses on traditional mortgage lending. Now let's discuss exposure to risk. Because SIs commonly use short-term liabilities to finance long-term assets, they depend on additional deposits to accommodate withdrawal requests. If new deposits aren't sufficient to cover withdrawal requests, an SI can experience liquidity problems. So to remedy this situation, SIs can obtain funds through repurchase agreements, borrow funds in the federal funds market, or sell assets in exchange for cash in the secondary market. Because mortgages represent an SI's primary asset, they're also the main source of their credit risk. Although the Federal Housing Authority and Veterans Administration mortgages originated by SIs are insured against credit risk, conventional mortgages aren't. Private insurance can usually be obtained for conventional mortgages, but SIs often incur the risk themselves rather than pay for the insurance. Some SIs rely heavily on short-term deposits as sources of funds and use most of their funds to provide fixed-rate mortgages. These SIs are subject to interest rate risk because their liabilities are rate-sensitive but their assets aren't. Thus, the spread between their interest revenue and interest expenses narrows when interest rates increase, which reduces their profitability. Now let's move on to management of interest rate risk. One of the methods SIs can use to manage their interest rate risk is through adjustable rate mortgages, or ARMS, where the interest rates are tied to market-determined rates, such as one-year treasury bills, and are periodically adjusted in accordance with a formula stated in the ARM contract. Adjustable rate mortgages enable SIs to maintain a more stable spread between interest revenue and expenses. An interest rate futures contract allows for the purchase of a specific amount of a particular debt security for a specified price at a future point in time. Sellers of future contracts are obligated to sell the securities for the contract price at the stated future point in time. Another strategy for reducing interest rate risk is to pursue interest rate swaps which allow an SI to swap their fixed rate outflow payments for variable rate inflow payments. The fixed rate outflow payments can be matched against the fixed rate mortgages held so that a certain spread can be achieved. In addition, the variable rate inflows due to the swap can be matched against the variable cost of funds. 
Although the hedging strategies described are useful, it's almost impossible to eliminate interest rate risk completely. The potential prepayment of mortgages can't be fully accounted for. Homeowners often pay off their mortgages before maturity without much advance notice to an SI. Therefore, the SIs don't really know the actual maturity of the mortgages they hold and can't perfectly match the interest rate sensitivity of their assets and liabilities. Now let's look at the exposure of savings institutions to crises. Savings institutions were devastated by the SI crisis during the late 1980s and by the credit crisis in the 2008-2009 period. One of the reasons for the SI crisis in the 80s was an increase in interest rates. Those SIs that provided long-term mortgages were adversely affected because the interest they earned on assets remained constant while the interest they paid on liabilities increased. Consequently, their net interest income declined. In addition, many SIs had been making commercial loans even though they lacked the expertise needed to accurately assess the firm's ability to repay those loans, resulting in defaults. Many SIs experienced a cash flow deficiency as a result of their loan losses, and the inflows from loan repayments weren't sufficient to cover depositor withdrawals. Many SIs also experienced financial problems during this period because of fraudulent activities. In one of the most common types of fraud, managers of SIs used depositors' funds to purchase personal assets, including yachts, artwork, and automobile dealerships. To prevent further failures and restore confidence, the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act, FERIA, was enacted in 1989 to increase penalties for officers of SIs and other financial institutions convicted of fraud, to raise the capital requirements for SIs, to allow commercial banks to acquire SIs, and require SIs to sell off any holdings of junk bonds. During the 2003-2006 to period of strong economic growth, some SIs used very liberal standards when offering subprime mortgage loans for borrowers who didn't qualify for conventional mortgages. The strategy was based on the presumption that new homeowners who were granted subprime mortgages would be able to afford their mortgage payments. Many SIs invested heavily in mortgage-backed securities without recognizing the potential credit risk of those securities. They subsequently incurred losses on these investments because of late payments or defaults on the mortgages represented by the securities. The financial problems of SIs were highlighted by several large failures, including Countrywide Financial, the second largest SI in the U.S., IndyMac, the eighth largest, and Washington Mutual, the largest savings institution. Following the credit crisis, Congress enacted the Financial Reform Act in 2010, which contained numerous provisions that were intended to stabilize the financial system and included other provisions that commercial banks were subject to relating to mortgage origination, sale of mortgage-backed securities, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, orderly liquidation, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and trading of derivative securities. The last key concept in the chapter is credit unions. Credit unions are non-profit organizations composed of members with a common bond, such as an affiliation with a particular labor union, church, university, or even residential area. Their objective is to serve as an intermediary for those members. Credit unions offer interest on shared deposits to members who invest funds and then channel those funds to members who need loans. Because CUs don't issue stock, they're technically owned by the depositors. These deposits are called shares, and interest paid on the deposits is called a dividend. Because CUs are nonprofit organizations, their income isn't taxed. Because CUs aren't taxed, they have an advantage over other types of financial institutions. Credit unions typically offer higher rate deposits, charge lower fees on checking accounts, have lower required minimum balances, and offer lower loan rates than their competitors, yet still achieve a satisfactory level of performance. In addition, their non-interest expenses are relatively low because their offices and furniture are often donated or provided at a very low cost through the affiliation of their members. Other characteristics of CUs can be less attractive, however. Their employees may not have the incentive to manage operations efficiently. Credit unions also may not have the funds to invest heavily in new technology and may not be able to offer the latest innovations in online and mobile banking. In addition, the common bond requirement for membership restricts a given CU from growing beyond the potential size of that particular affiliation and limits the CU's ability to diversify. Approximately 90% of CUs are insured by the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, or NCUSIF, which is administered by the National Credit Union Administration, NCUA. The CUs typically pay an insurance premium of about one-tenth of one percent of their share deposits, and the NCUSIF sets aside a portion of its funds as reserves 
to cover expenses resulting from CU failures each year. Federal CUs are supervised and regulated by the NCUA, whereas state-chartered CUs are regulated by the respective states. NCUA examiners conduct annual assessments of all federally chartered CUs, as well as any state chartered CUs applying for federal insurance. As part of the assessment, the examiners classify each CU into specific risk category ranging from low risk to high risk to identify CUs that are experiencing problems or are in potential danger. The same CAMELS criteria used by the FDIC to assess commercial banks and savings institutions are used by the NCUA to assess risk. Credit union sources of funds can be classified as deposits, borrowed funds, and capital. Credit unions obtain most of their funds from share deposits by members. Credit unions also offer share certificates, which provide higher rates than share deposits, but require the member to invest a minimum amount and have a specified maturity. The share certificates offered by CUs compete against the retail CDs offered by commercial banks and SIs. In addition to share deposits and certificates, most CUs offer checkable accounts called share drafts. If a CEU needs funding temporarily, it can borrow from other CEUs or from the Central Liquidity Facility, or CLF, which acts as a lender for CEUs to accommodate seasonal funding and specialized needs or to boost the liquidity of troubled CEUs. Like other depository institutions, CEUs maintain capital, and their primary source of capital is retained earnings. In recent years, CEUs have boosted their capital, which helps cushion these institutions against future loan losses. Given that CEUs tend to use conservative management, their capital ratio is relatively high compared with other depository institutions. Credit unions use the majority of their funds to make loans to members. These loans finance automobiles, home improvement, and other personal expenses. The loans are typically secured and carry maturities of five years or less. Some CEUs offer long-term mortgage loans, but many prefer to avoid loans with long maturities. In addition to providing loans, CEUs purchase government and agency securities to maintain adequate liquidity. Like other depository institutions, CEUs are exposed to liquidity risk, credit risk, and interest rate risk. Their balance sheet structure differs from that of other institutions, however, so their exposure to each type of risk also differs. If a CEU experiences an unanticipated wave of withdrawals without an offsetting amount of new deposits, it could become illiquid. Because CEUs concentrate on making personal loans to their members, their exposure to credit or default risk is primarily derived from those loans. Most of their loans are secured, which reduces the loss to CEUs in the event of default. Although CEUs are often viewed as the most conservative of all depository institutions, they were still exposed to the adverse effects of the credit crisis. Although CEUs are restricted from investing in risky securities, some of the mortgage-backed securities that they purchased were highly rated at the time of purchase. As housing conditions worsened, the demand for securities backed by mortgages declined and the value of the mortgage-backed securities declined as well. Finally, loans by CEUs to their members typically have short or intermediate maturities, so their asset portfolios are rate-sensitive. Because their sources of funds are also generally rate-sensitive, movements in interest revenues and interest expenses of CEUs are highly correlated. Thus, CEUs tend to have less exposure to interest rate risk than savings institutions.